Trajan helped to make Rome the most sophisticated place on earth. The city had every technology. One of its greatest wonders was its aqueducts. Aqueducts were an engineering breakthrough. They brought the purest water directly to the homes of Rome's one million citizens. Graceful arches spanning the countryside and amazing tunnels below the ground brought an incredible 200 million gallons of fresh water into the city every day. This incredible system became the life force of Rome and the engineering blueprint for every modern city ever since. Rome was an extraordinarily hot city then as it is now and one of the things the emperors and those in charge of building were most concerned about was a ready supply of water. So there are fountains then as well as now on almost every corner and this would have been true also for the courtyards of the elite houses. Under the Emperor Trajan, an entire government department was set up headed by a famous engineer called Frontinus. Frontinus was Trajan's water engineer and an extraordinarily meticulous man. He wrote a book about his activities, which we still have, on the water supply of Rome, which gives us details that otherwise we wouldn't possess about the aqueducts and how they functioned. It had long been established that the freshest water came not from the river Tiber, but from the foothills and natural springs outside Rome. Provided they flowed from high ground, the springs could be channeled through aqueducts down to the city below. As Roman engineers became more experienced, they were able to defy any obstacle. In time, they would construct a 260-mile-long network of tunnels and aqueducts. Before building could start, the degree of slope had to be determined. This angle would become the incline of the aqueduct across hills and valleys all the way to Rome. Before any water entered the aqueduct, it passed through several purification tanks. Here, flow rate was restricted to allow impurities to fall as sediment. Along most of their route from the hills of Rome into the city, stretches of up to seven miles, the aqueducts would have been in tunnels like this one, dug often straight through hillsides or under towns and villages. They were dug by hand and beautifully built, so much so that they're the only ancient Roman public service still in regular use today. But when the aqueduct appeared the other side, the land often sloped away towards the city. So to maintain the flow gradient, the channel had to be raised and supported by a wall of brick or stone. As the ground sloped away further, so the wall was built up. But when it exceeded six feet, it became too costly to build. The solution was an architectural innovation the Romans perfected, the arch. This is an absolutely standard semicircular Roman arch built with cut stones. It's about 18 foot span and there may be a 27 stones in the whole arch. The Roman engineers used formwork, a wooden supporting frame over which the arch was assembled. When the stones were in place, cement was applied and then rubble to build the structure up to the top. Once the keystone is in, they can strike the wooden frame and let the arch take the weight and all that force coming down the stones finally through the piers to the ground. Then they can finish the aqueduct on top. With arches, aqueducts could cross valleys but arches could become unsteady. So Roman engineers had to explore every technique to make them stable. When an aqueduct crossed a river, greater stability was given to the base by specially shaping it to deflect the current. But when arches grew too tall, they could twist and become unstable. So the Roman solution was to limit their height to just 70 feet. Sometimes, to maintain the correct gradient, the aqueducts needed to be even higher. So a second tier of arches was placed above the first. One aqueduct was even built with three tiers, 180 feet high. For Roman aqueducts, cement would bring about a breakthrough when engineers discovered a waterproof cement to line the bottom of the channel. In the bottom of the channel. It was made from Pozzolana, a volcanic ash, which when mixed with lime became a mortar 
which could even set hard underwater. This is the channel in the aqueduct that brought the water down to ancient Rome. It's quite wide and it would have brought about 40 million gallons a day down into the city. Lined as it was with a lime and terracotta mix, it was waterproof along its length. But why go to all this architectural expense when a pipeline would have done the same job? The Romans could have brought the water to Rome by pipeline running along the ground surface. But of course that would have had problems to do with the pressure in the pipe. So by putting the water up here on an aqueduct in a channel instead of in a pipe, they could supply it easily and quickly with a simple form of construction. It's covered, of course, to protect it from evaporating and from getting dirty with things blowing into it. Roman thinking was that if pipes were hidden underground, any break would be hard to detect and repair. Pipes could only be made out of terracotta. Roman engineers avoided lead. It was expensive and known to be poisonous. They also learned that pipes collect sediment, which sat at the low points in the system, creating pressure points. The great advantage of aqueducts was that they could be easily inspected and maintained. Aqueducts could easily cross plains, but very deep valleys and ravines were a problem. To cross them, the Roman engineers built a cistern each side. Then they funneled the water down a pipe. Its own weight would push it up the other side. The first gravity-driven siphon. This would be a pipeline which went from the aqueduct down into the valley and up to another tank on the other side where the water could go back into the aqueduct. When the water finally entered Rome, it filled three reservoirs. The first served the essential public supply. The second, the public baths. And the third went to private households who paid a water tax. The money levied from the private sector helped to pay for the public water system, which took priority. The public always had plenty. Controlling the public was the number one concern of every emperor. Their lives depended on it. Trajan had given Rome the first permanent stadium, a forum, a shopping center, and regulated the water supply. One hundred years later, Rome was under the control of the Emperor Caracalla, and he was to build the Roman people the most lavish public building ever conceived. It was, in effect, a public palace, the most luxurious and sophisticated health spa of all time. And everyone could go there. <laughs>